When we talk about the future, there is a lot of talk about Doom. Not the 1990s video game, but Doom for planet Earth. We see pictures of burning Earth, climate Armageddon, plastic filling up the ocean. And then there's that video of the sea turtle with the straw stuck so deeply in its nose. And you can see from this image of the Earth on fire, a zombie stag made of trash, a human head deformed into a fish, and a baby as a sea turtle about to be knifed, that the entire environmental movement is predicated on a story of doom. But I am over it, you see? I've been trying to save the Earth since I was eight years old, and I saved up my pocket money to buy a mug from Greenpeace to help save the dolphins, and I am done with doom. And I'm here to talk to you today about a better way to save the Earth. One that doesn't fill me with dread for the apocalypse, but instead, this way, fills me with wonder and ideas. It's simple, but it's deep, and it's this. We need a beautiful, optimistic vision of the amazing future we are making. And amongst the onslaught of negative news about our planet, this vision has been painfully missing. And I want to take you on a journey of what I'm talking about, an example of just how beautiful the future could be. So let's slip out of the doomosphere and take a ride on the train to eco-utopia. And imagine this. What if cities grew out of the age of pollution and smog and evolved into rolling ecoscapes, patchworked with green roofs, with orchards nestled into parks, and vegetable gardens cascading off the sides of city buildings, so you could just put your arm out the side and pick a cucumber and make a salad. And everything smelled good, <laughs> for real. Everything smelled good, like a forest. Imagine when freeways could get taken out and replaced with electric trains and bike paths and those green bridges for deer and koalas holding their baby koalas to walk across. That's a real photo, by the way. <laughs> and we're done with plastic and junk, and our next generation of children grow their own fruit and vegetables at school. Amazing vegan food is available everywhere in compostable packaging, and landfill is extinct. And we finally got it together to leave the fish and the dolphins in the ocean alone. And think of a new age when science, technology, and manufacturing grew in a symbiotic partnership with nature instead of at the expense of it. And imagine the day when the sun sets on the age of fossil fuels and the sun rises on a billion solar panels that power our new world. And just, it sounds amazing, right? And just in case you thought this was a fairy tale or a fantasy, let me share some evidence that this is actually already happening. Expensive solar panels, smoke in the air, and child mortality has all been dropping rapidly, and the amount of protected nature has been going up. And this two-story mega freeway in South Korea got taken out 10 years ago and replaced with this green natural waterway. Even carbon dioxide emissions, the big issue of our time, has been going down in America recently and in other developed countries. But even though change is sprouting up all around us, there is still a giant obstacle in front of us. <laughs> it's a big rock. Um, <laughs> and I don't think that this obstacle is greed or mega corporations or all those type of things that we hear about. I think what will power us over this obstacle is imagination, a vision of the future world we want, and the creativity to make that vision happen. And just in case, <laughs> just in case you think that these three words sound flaky or soft in the context of major world issues, like you can't just macrame your way to a carbon neutral economy, right? But hear me out. 
because I've spent a lifetime trying to understand how to save the planet as an environmental engineer, a green building designer, a tech startup founder. I even just wrote a book literally called How to Save the World. <laughs> and I've read hundreds of academic papers about the psychology of how to get people to do pro-environmental things. And what I found at the bottom of all of the technology and the politics and the blame is that it is vision and creativity that drives change. And here's why. Let's start with building a movement. You may be familiar with this quote. If you want to build a ship, do not drum up the men to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. See, a vision that you can articulate not only unleashes the dream in you, but it unleashes it in everyone around you. And that is why the Martin Luther King speech was so powerful, because it was constructed from a vision of a positive future. And he used those magical words, I have a dream. I want to share a story about why I'm so passionate about this. One of my earliest childhood memories was of my mother and I taking a trip to the city. And I remember looking out the back window of our small white Volkswagen and looking at these, I was shocked by these industrial overhanging train lines and these grimy buildings with that soot that comes down from the roof. And every time I saw it, I thought, why have all the grown-ups not covered all of this nasty junk with morning glories? Not any other flower, but specifically the purple morning glory. It was a vine. I knew it could be grown on anything. Obviously, at four years old, I knew I had the solution. <laughs> but that image of urban grime reimagined as living moss and ferns and flowers, it never went away. When I was 21 at university in Melbourne, I would look out at the city and imagine trees growing out of all of the buildings. And then when I moved to Silicon Valley, I would imagine a new age where we'd use sensors and data to deeply understand and care for our Earth. And I never stopped seeing the world in two layers like a transparency of the new overlayering the old, like this image. And recently, I got inspired for an idea for a documentary about all this called Imagine a New Earth. So I made this poster, and I posted it to Twitter, and I was overrun with messages and comments. It was the most popular thing I have ever posted. And I could see how, at a deep soul level, we are craving a new story for a future that we can believe in. So, you've heard my version of I Have a Dream. What's yours? What would the vast and endless sea be that you would have people join you on? What would you write on this notepad? And this dream of yours, it has a secret superpower. It's optimism. Think of optimism like a vitamin. Study after study shows that optimism is good for you. Optimists work harder, optimists make more money, optimists are healthier, optimists even live longer. And optimists achieve their goals because they don't give up. And when it comes to changing the world, being optimistic about the future of climate change or food or democracy, it doesn't mean living in a naive bubble of complacency. It's having a goal and having the fire of motivation in you to make that dream happen. And optimists are happier. And that's because in the brain, optimism releases dopamine, the chemical responsible for happiness and motivation. And happiness matters in our quest to save the world because a positive mood allows us to solve complex problems and come up with great ideas. Now, feelings like fear, doom, and helplessness are really bad for the brain. They activate the amygdala. That's the part of the brain that responds to stress and goes into fight or flight. And when that happens, it releases chemicals that shut down your prefrontal cortex. That's the mental sketch pad of the brain. 
And when this happens, you lose about 30% of your cerebral brain function, and your capacity for creative thought gets turned off. And researchers say that functioning in this state is like looking out at the world through a tiny pinhole. And they also say that images that are frightening and scary largely fail to motivate us to take action. And we need to take action. And creativity, creativity is all about taking action to do things that have not been done before. And that is what makes changing the world an inherently creative act. And the first step in creating anything is visualizing a mental model of what you want to make. Think of how an architect imagines a new building, or a dressmaker imagines a gown. Before they start their project, in their mind, they imagine a detailed mental model of what they want to make, and then they reverse engineer that idea into reality. And it's in this dance between imagining and making, and imagining and making, that is the guts of the creative process of bringing an idea and a vision for this future world to life. So I'm an engineer now, but I spent my childhood doing art. And one thing my mother did really well was introduce me to all of the creative media. We did clay, silk screening, knitting, sewing, FIMO. Does everyone remember FIMO? Um, OK, nobody remembers FIMO. <laughs> Maybe it was just in Australia. Um, but I didn't have many friends, and our family had some difficulties. But despite it all, I made things. I spent my childhood immersed in bridging the gap between imagining and making. And so when it came to trying to save the planet, I had this almost naive confidence that I could actually make all my ideas happen. And it's in that gap where so many people are stymied by the story of doom. Because doom creates paralysis, but it's creativity that inspires action. And if you're dooming out on the apocalypse, you are not imagining or making anything useful. And that is what's called the neurotic imagination. For real, that's a scientific term. It is. <laughs> the neurotic imagination is the bad kind that ruminates over and over about everything that could go wrong. And to create this world of our dreams, we need to get out of the neurotic imagination and into the driver's seat of what is called the positive, constructive imagination. And when we're talking about saving the planet, I like to call it the environmental design imagination. And it has to do some crazy cerebral feats, like imagining what it will take to cover an entire city in vegetation. And it has to come up with an abundance of great ideas, everything from high-tech bamboo water bottles to three-wheeled electric scooters to big satellite-driven data systems. And then it has to figure out how to reverse engineer all those ideas into reality. And this isn't just about creating good vibes or cute ideas to help people recycle. When I'm talking about imagination and creativity, I'm talking about tackling the biggest engineering design challenge that ever was. Building a modern civilization that can exist harmoniously and sustainably on the planet, that requires a vast Re a vast revolution in all of our infrastructure, our factories, our farming, our scientific research, our electricity grid, the way we teach our children, even the way we eat. It all needs to be redesigned. And that is far more complicated than going to the moon. And it is a far bigger and greater design challenge. And it is way more exciting than going to Mars. And this process of imagining this new world and creatively making it happen, that is the process of literally reverse engineering the future. So, which brain will get us there? The small, stressed out, neurotic brain? Riddled with stress, trapped within the problem, looking out through a tiny pinhole, or the big, optimistic brain that is high on ideas and dopamine. 
And all this, all this comes down to making measurable change right now. These days, I design software to help save the planet by connecting a goal with actions that we can take now. And I try to make it as fun as a game, or what I like to call a Fitbit for the planet. And it is so fun, and it started to get really good for me when I started to do this one thing. Three years ago, I was pushing my toddler in a stroller up a very steep hill in San Francisco. I was exhausted, and I was listening to this audiobook called The Big Leap. And the author says that you should spend time every day in what he calls your zone of genius. So I committed to spending one or even three hours a day in my creative, in my creative genius zone. It was nothing glamorous, just putting on my alarm at 6 a.m. in a tiny bedroom with a toddler asleep next to me and opening my computer. And since that day on that hill, I have created the best environmental world-changing work of my life. And that daily commitment has led me to talk to you right here today. And what I know for sure is that when you step into your creative genius zone, you step onto an upward creative spiral. And it's in that zone, in that circle, where changing the world is no longer a fight or a sacrifice or to go without. Instead, it becomes your greatest art form. And that's where you will do the great work of your life that will change the world. And we do it by practicing three things. The first is, imagine the future you know, that's beautiful and peaceful in all its detail. The second is, make time every day for your creative genius. And the third is, distill your vision into action that you can take now that will create measurable change. I don't think that we're hurtling towards doom. I think that we're only just hatching out of our infancy. And now I have a little girl of my own, and she's four, and I'm teaching her how to imagine and how to make. And I can see so clearly now how we need to show her generation and my generation how to not be a victim of the future, but to create the future. Like, it is the canvas, and we are the artist. And that's a dream that I can really get behind, that imagination put into action will save the world. Thank you.